So Chestnut Grove, we're having a series of conversations together where I hope we can hear and learn lessons, where we can hear the observations of this particular group of us this week. What was their experience like? And as the people who tend to lead the way into what's next, what can we learn from them? What do we old people need to, sorry if that was offensive to you, what do we need to hold on to as we shape what it looks like to be congregation moving forward? So um, a few of you saw a few weeks ago, Youth Sunday, we heard some um, of the experiences of Mariah and Asher among some others, but those two especially. And Mariah reminded me of how rich it is when we tell truth to each other, when we tell the real story of what's happening. And I think sometimes church may be the most dishonest place that we come because we don't tell the truth about what's really happening so often. We can't decode whitewash. Mariah set a precedent that I hope we can stick to today, um, not to air everything negative, but just to tell the truth so that we might move forward together in that way. So thank you for your willingness, guys, to be candid and tell the truth and um, help us figure out together what's ahead. I would ask you this first question. If you had to... uh, Describe your pandemic experience in one word. What word would you pick? Conrad, let's start with you. Um, I think if I had to describe my experience in one word, I'd probably say formless and lacking external structure and um, you know, not necessarily with a particular momentum in any direction. So. Was it anything like wandering in the wilderness? Interesting. Um, I didn't do anything fancy. I was just going to say difficult because that's what it felt like. The one word that I could describe the pandemic in would probably be patience because we were locked inside for 14 months. The last two months were a little better because we could like go outside, not have masks. Vaccine was starting to roll out. But the first 12 months, it was a very patient experience because we were just stuck inside with nothing to do. The only way we could go outside was either go to the grocery store or get gas. (laughs) So it was very patient. It was a very patient 12 months. Um, The word that I chose was paradoxical. It means seemingly absurd or contradictory. I chose this word because not only was this year absurd, I also felt like a lot of the things that happened in this year was contradictory, where I didn't always get to see my friends, but yet I was still able to strengthen friendships and a lot of things like that. I said that this experience for me was reflective. Um, I was able to look back on times that I had with people that I enjoyed and also times that I had that weren't that great. Um, it, was, it was definitely a period of high highs and low lows where for days you wouldn't see anyone that you enjoyed and then at other times you would have wonderful moments with people you haven't seen in a long time that were just freeing. So. Great. Uh, Chester Grove, was the, was the pandemic for any of us paradoxical, patient, reflective, anxious, formless? Is that true for any of us? Yeah. Yeah. Good descriptors, I would say. I was thinking about the line from the song you sang. He he brings our chaos back into order. He brings our formlessness back into order. Uh, Asher, you said you, there are days when you don't see people you enjoy, but all of you were stuck at home with your parents and your siblings. For... <laughs> well, there were a few days where I was stuck in my room alone, so I guess we could count that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, would one or two of you like to explain or describe what it was like to try to have relationships and friendships during this time? I can go. Um, I, it really helped figure out, it, it helped me figure out who was actually there for me because rather than being forced to see people at school or at work or just in life in general, life was put on pause. So the people that you interacted with were purely out of their desire and your desire. So 
it it really showed who was there for me and I, I think it helped those friendships grow and other friendships deteriorated because that's what happens when you don't see someone for almost a year. But I think that it was definitely helpful in some senses of bringing the people who are closest to me even closer. So that was, that was good for me. My experience was really similar to Asher's. Um, I think I want to have Conrad answer this because I loved his answer in the first one. So, Conrad, do you know? Oh. Uh, well, I said that most of my friendships kind of fizzled out, which sounds really depressing. But, um, but it was good because I guess I had taken friendships for granted as kind of something that either happens or, or doesn't. But I realized it was more of like a like a chemical reaction, like you need you know, both um, reactants need to be coming into contact at the same time and continuously, and it's kind of a, a mutual active thing you need to work on. So it gave me a kind of new perspective on what it means to have friendships. Friendships take work. Relationships take work. I'd like to add on to what Asher said about um, being stuck at home with parents. Yeah, that does something to a person. You were right. It does something to a person. <laughs> you learn a lot of stuff you didn't know. You grow relationships with your siblings if you have siblings. Lots of siblings, not that many siblings. You grow a relationship with your parents that you probably didn't have before because you're all stuck in the same household. Thank goodness for pets. They keep you away from your parents if you need this <laughs> space away. We established in the first gathering that that parents likewise were stuck. <laughs> <laughs> and we loved it, didn't we? We just nothing but love. All right, maybe some maybe some of the same kind of ups and downs of being at home all together more than normal um, taught us some things too you know about family um, one observation just real quick that I uh, you know Asher is my son and he spent his senior year mostly at home that's very unusual for a senior high school boy who's about to launch to college but it created an, an opportunity for me to spend time with him that I would not have gotten to spend and I will treasure that time that we got to it was forced Family fun, <laughs> but uh, a treasure for me. So, Zach, uh, would a few of you maybe speak out about what this has been like for your your mental health and your emotional well-being? Um, I can start. This year has been the rockiest year for my mental health. Uh, I didn't always make the team or get a, you know, ace the test, and a lot of my relationships, like friendships and acquaintanceships, didn't really go the way that I had wanted them to. So it was hard, uh, especially because a lot of times, you know, the things that are more stressful in my life, like school, you know, I still have to do. And I didn't always have things like friends to ground me while I was doing school because it was just at home. Um, but I was able to always have my family and I did have friends in my life throughout the entire pandemic, whether it was only like one or two that I was really talking to at that time uh, or, you know, as it went on, it grew once we started doing athletics again and um, going back into school. But this year was definitely one of the hardest for me. And I'm glad that things are getting uh, back to normal a little bit more. So I'm able to have those things that ground me to help me through some of the more stressful times. One thing about mental health is sometimes you can be like in a good state of mental health, sometimes you can be in a bad st state of mental health. It just depends on where you are as a person at that moment. Like take online school for example. You, you didn't have any deadlines, that was nice, but it brought out a few of our lazy sides, <laughs> just saying. You didn't get to see your friends at all, so you didn't get to interact at all. You didn't get to have a good social social life, because, like Asher said, school forced you to talk to people and be nice to others. So without actual school to go into and be forced to talk to people, you're just stuck in a rut the entire school year. 
But hybrid actually changed a lot of that because I met a couple new friends when hybrid school started up again. Because like, a lot of new people had joined in eighth grade and we actually got to talk to each other because of hybrid school. So sometimes being forced to talk to each other can be a bad thing and sometimes being forced to talk to each other can be a good thing. You just never know. What about your experience with your faith and your spirituality and um, being with God during this time? What was that like and have you learned anything about yourself or how to take care of yourself and your spirituality? Um, I think I kind of touched on this at Youth Sunday a bit, but... um, You know, the pandemic was really hard for my faith. I think at the beginning, I was really, like, anxious because I didn't know if I was going to get my junior prom. I didn't know if I was going to get to go to camp with the youth group. I didn't know what was going to happen. And I like being in control. And so I was really anxious all the time. And so I was like, no, I'm going to take this anxiety and I'm going to bring it to God. And I was praying and I was doing devotionals extra, on like, all the time. And... That lasted for about two months, and then it kind of slowly faded out, and then by July and June, I wasn't doing anything, Um, and then as my depression got worse, I was really ashamed, and so coming to God with that was really hard for me, and for someone who was really a big prayer and big believer of the power of prayer, it was really hard for me because I didn't pray for three months straight. I couldn't come to God. Like, I knew he was there, but it was just more of an obligation than a I felt like I should, like, I felt like I should because I had to, not because I wanted to. Um, And so even now it's still kind of affecting me and prayer is harder for me than it used to be because I went so long without it and it changed the way I look at it. Um, And also I've always been someone who likes noise. I don't like the silence. Um, And so even if I'm doing schoolwork or doing prayer or whatever, I either have music on, I have a TV show on in the background, like whatever it is, I just hate the silence. And so throughout the pandemic, I've kind of learned to go off by myself in a really silent place, like the quietest room in our house and do my devotional there instead of having worship music on in the background, just so I can be more present. I also struggled during the pandemic. Um, because at the beginning, the the chain completely broke down, and the the routines that I had been in for years of going to church on Sunday and having youth group and spending time at the church in between services talking with people that was all gone, and there's not much replacement for that. Uh, and so the 18 years of habit that I had kind of fell apart a little bit, and. When that happens, it's hard to hard to keep going. So at the beginning, there was just a void, um, and I'm still working on recovering that. Uh, it's definitely been a time of spiritual struggle for me, and I think that that's kind of common because I know many people have been going to church their entire life, but now they can't. And how do you how do you fill that, and how do you fix that? So personally, I I didn't know what to do, really. Um, And I I kind of had a bit of distance between me and my spirituality. And that's something that I'm still working on. But I found that during this time, I would find myself praying more often. Not in big ways or like super intentional and meaningful ways, but whenever I would think of someone that I was missing or whenever I would have have an issue that I came across or a particularly hard day, um, it, I would just send up a little prayer. And it wasn't anything large or anything super impactful, but it was sort of a comforting way in the time of separation where I felt like I was a part of something in, in a community even though we couldn't be together. Faith is a weird thing to a middle schooler or a high schooler, because high schoolers, they realize that God is there. Like, high schoolers know, like, what faith is, 
middle schoolers like understand what it means, but they don't like fully get it. Cause that's where I am right now. Cause I'm the only middle schooler slash going into high school or on this stage. Asher and Mariah are graduating, and Kelly and Conrad are going into the final grade. So I'm the youngest one on this stage, and at the eighth grade graduation, it they gave us our certificates, because I can't call it a diploma, because that's a high school thing. But um, they gave us our, our certificates, I left, and, I, and three big questions enter my brain. What is my relationship with my friends gonna be like? What is schoolwork gonna be like? Cause eighth grade was very different. And what is God gonna be like to me? So I was thinking about that a lot. And over the summer or in the fall and the winter, I'd really reflected on like who I think God is and what I think the spirit is and who I think Jesus is and what he did for me. Like, take the service during Easter where we were nailing that, those nails into the cross. That was, the, that was kind of like a boom moment in my faith because I realized that that was really powerful and I didn't realize that until later that night. And then a few weeks ago, I had explained that the Holy Spirit was most likely the breath of God, because breathing is a concurrent theme in all of scripture. So as you get older, you can see your faith grows stronger and stronger. So the older you get, the more understanding you have of faith. So that's kind of where I am at right now. I just want to let you know, Brody, I don't have a great understanding of faith, and I think that a lot of people out here will tell you that they're still working on that themselves. I wish all the answers came in high school, but that's not exactly what happens. Um, one of the that in mind. <laughs> one of the things I've been doing personally to kind of keep my faith going and help me get more understanding is I've been starting to read through the Bible. Um, I highly recommend you do it. I thought it was going to be something I did later in life, but I've had the opportunity to do it now that I've had more time and less time in church. Um, it's super challenging, and it's confusing at times, and honestly, it gets a little boring. I'm not going to lie. I skipped through a lot of names in Chronicles, but um, <laughs> it's still a way for me to think about the Bible, because obviously that's God's word, and everything in there has meaning, and so just kind of going through that and seeing how it applies, and I also uh, look up YouTube videos on the Bible Project, which I also highly recommend to kind of help me understand where I may be lacking so great so can we spend the next last 10 minutes we'll say um, answering this question and, and feel free to to give some answer and to tell why with some of the other content that you may have prepared for this conversation but the question is this um, friends I'm I'm presupposing that we are writing the script for what it is to be a Christian congregation moving forward. We get to shape how this community experience feels and looks. We get to shape the rhythms with the Spirit together. So my question for you is, what do you need from your community of faith? What do you hope for? How can we together craft a communal experience that would be even more vibrant than what was before? So I was thinking about this a lot because Lance had told us last service this was going to be a question. So I reflected a, re reflected a lot on that while we were waiting for the next service to start. And the main thing that popped into my head was modernizing it. What, well, I think that this church modernizes a lot of the scripture. Lance does a great job of modernizing it, like playing rock music. We will always remember that service, Lance. We'll never forget. But um, we do a lot of modernizing here. But I'm thinking to like, not the youth group, but for the children downstairs for modernizing it for them. Because we, half our lives of church, have been studying the old, and now we're starting to get into the new. 
So thinking into the far future when the kids downstairs are in youth, I think it would be great if that was very modern for them, like current type stuff, like referencing like what's going on in the news, because that doesn't happen in church, thankfully, but it could be useful. I'm just saying, modernizing would be a good idea. Um, so I've got a few different things. But for me, I think one thing is like you said, what do you need from like the community? And that's like the answer lies within the question, community. It's, it's what we need, but um, like for me right now in the place where I am, I'm going to PVCC in the fall, but I'll still be living with my parents. I'll still be in Earliesville. And so, and I've kind of known this for a while and I've kind of been pondering where my place is in the church. And so, and, and I've kind of found, and if this is offensive, I'm really sorry, that there's not really a place for young adults at this church. Um, we have the youth group, but then we don't have a place for college kids. We don't have a place for people immediately after college who might come home to Charlottesville or even people who just move here because that's where their job is or whatever that are young. And, um, and I think it's really needed. Um, and I think not only that, but just because even when college kids come home, for the weekend, for the fall break, for the Christmas break. There's nothing for them. And, you know, it makes it, looking into the future, it will make it a lot harder for their faith, I think, versus, like, if there was an activity where, like, hey, we want you to still be connected to this church, so we're going to have, like, a picnic outside after church or anything like that, or even just a Sunday school class for when the breaks typically are. I think it's just something that might be helpful to the people who are adjusting and not just to me, but um, yeah, that community. Thank you, Mariah. Believe it or not, we've talked about that for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> we have. We've prayed about it for a long time. Yeah. We need to do something about it. That's an excellent point. Amen. Amen. Going along with what Mariah said, I think that community is something that we definitely should go with, um, do moving forward. One of the things that I got to do in the pandemic was I got to do this uh, book club group with uh, a bunch of people from the church of all um, ages. And what we did was we read this book on racism and then we had discussions about it and there were questions in the book that we kind of talked about every week. And that was actually something that I thought was really helpful for me and it helped me grow. And um, it was awesome to hear different people's perspectives that were not ha um, from the same uh, background as me that grew up in a different environment and in a different time. And also there was another youth member in my group. So it was really interesting to hear hear from their perspective too. So I think doing more things like that, getting to hear different people's um, opinions and perspectives on uh, topics that are not necessarily always religion based because sometimes I tend to separate religion from other aspects of my life. Like, oh, I've got school and I've got my sports and then I've got church. And I think that it's important to kind of bring church into everything because it's not something that you only do like on Sundays from eight to 12 or whatever. It's, it's something that should apply to your whole life. And I think it's important that we do talk about those other things. And I think it would be really cool to be able to hear from a bunch of different people. I would say my, my answer might be a little bit more shallow, but I, I miss the days of potlucks and banquets. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe those are still happening and I'm just not invited because I eat too much. <laughs> but I, I, I really think there is something about eating together. Um, it's something everyone's got to do. And eating with people that you enjoy is m maybe not always a spiritual occasion, but it, it really does bring people together in special ways. And some of my greatest memories are the meals on the mission trip or the morning of Christmas when we would have biscuits and gravy or pig pickings outside on the basketball court. Um, so while it might be a little bit shallow, those, those things really are meaningful and those are how I met some incredible friends through the church and some very wise older people that I wouldn't have met otherwise. Um, and that's where I get the best mac and cheese and I really miss that. <laughs> so.
I, I think that would be beneficial to the community of all ages, just being able to interact on just the most basic human level of sharing a meal together. Um, I feel kind of bad saying this because I feel like we've done similar things in the past and I haven't always taken the most advantage of it. But I think that kind of a, a intermediate point between being in the church and being active in the community is connecting with other churches. And um, obviously I can see why we haven't been able to do that recently, but now that we're coming out of the pandemic, that's a common experience that all churches have. Um, so maybe a, doing more inter-church type things would be cool or potentially beneficial. Adding to what Asher said about the banquets and stuff like that, we should bring Follies back. I miss that. <laughs> like, like, not just that, just the laughs that everyone would get from the Follies. Like, I've never experienced genuine joy like that outside of school when I would, like, when people would laugh and, at some jokes. But that was a genuine joy. I just felt genuine joy when that would happen. Also, Letting youth perform in that would be hilarious. Just saying. Or we could just get Frank Balif in a mess, <laughs> mesh tank top again. <laughs> That's like a Sunday thing that should have happened. <laughs> Part of the new liturgy, the mesh tank top moment. Frank stance. <laughs> yeah. What other things do you wish for us to hear, my friends? I think participation is key. Um, I know, at least in my life, when I get an email from the school saying, oh, we're having this thing to celebrate the band, or we're having this thing to celebrate seniors, or we're having this thing to celebrate our teachers, um, it, it's hard for me to assert myself and actually join in. But every time that I do, I always enjoy it, and it's always an incredible time. Um, and I have the same struggles with church. When I, when I do get an email that tells me that there's going to be a game outside or that youth is going on a trip um, or there's going to be a mission trip or something, often I'll put it off and I won't put it in my calendar and I'll be like, oh, that sounds fun, but I'm sure they'll have fun without me. Um, and it seems like that's becoming more and more common, at least in my life. Maybe that's because I'm getting older and I'm getting more busy or something else like that, I don't know. Um, but participation, at least for me, is really important in growing community because if I wasn't forced to be at all the banquets when I was a kid um, by my parents who really had to be there because this is kind of their job, um, if, I, if I wasn't expected to be there, it, I wouldn't have those incredible moments and I wouldn't meet the incredible people that I've already met here. So I think that just participating in the events that are presented is very important and something that I need to work on because I'm not always the best at that. I have another thing. Um, so support. Um, for a lot of us, like for at least Praise Band, we get up here and we sing. And like a lot of people just see us for a moment on stage in our best, doing our best, because we're up here and we're leading and we've practiced for a month. And so they're like, oh, well, that those people have it all together. I After my um, Youth Sunday story, I heard a lot of people like, I couldn't even tell. I don't even, like, you never showed it, that you were depressed, that you were going through this. And I would say that's probably not just for me. That's probably for every teenager in this congregation where if you go up to them and you like genuinely have a conversation with them, they're probably gonna hide it if it's surface level. But if you really start to get to know them, you might see that, wow, it's more than I thought. It's more than what you would see from afar. And I think a lot of adults might be like, oh, well, if you want to do this with me, or if you want to get coffee, or if you want to go out for lunch or whatever. But I think there's a little bit of overlooking uh, the fact that a lot of teenagers are still kind of scared and still a little bit nervous to like reach out to an adult and be like, you had offered to get coffee, so can we? That's like a really scary thing. So like if instead of saying, you know, reach out to me, 
ask, do you want to get coffee? If they say yes, then you plan it because we're, we don't have it all together. And I think it's really important to get connected to older people so that we can be mentored. Hey, older people, did you hear that? <laughs> did you hear that ask? Mariah, would you like to have coffee with me? Yes. There you go. We are shaping the future right this second. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say thank you because um, I think these conversations are really valuable and assessing what we can do better is really valuable. But I also think that the church has done really well over the pandemic and, you know, simultaneously being safe, but also interacting. And so um, I think part of looking forward is also seeing not just what hasn't worked, but what has. And I think we've been pretty flexible and been able to adapt pretty well. And that's been something that I've enjoyed a lot is watching worship and all of those things. So um, good job, I guess. <laughs> right. This might be the final thing. Anyone else want to add something? If I say it's a final thing, OK. But um, I remember a, I remember a few weeks ago when Lance had planned that thing with the parents and the youth and the tweens to do that plunger ball. I just think that would be fun to do more of that type of stuff. Like. Like Mariah said, mentoring. That's basically mentoring, except with activities and stuff like that. So I just think that'd be more fun for like the adults and the youth and the tweens, because it like, because it helps us grow. It helps us like figure out how these ad how the, how adulting works, I guess. <laughs> Because clearly the school doesn't teach that, especially not taxes. <laughs> Zach? Yeah. I think we have instructions. Chestnut Grove, I think we have some instructions. I think we have some new insights about what it looks like. Brody, I think your reflection to Plunger Ball, which is actually a Lance King original, um, is absurd, but it is driving a big part of what's going on in me right now as I think about what our future looks like together. What does it look like to be the people of God? Well, it looks different as times change. We're not trying to recreate Brody's grandfather's church. We're trying to create per Brody's instructions, a church where these little guys are going to have a place where they can grow in their faith. And, and one day, Grant Farr, whose birthday is today, one day Grant Farr is going to sit up on this stool and Heidi and John are going to be fighting back tears. And Grant Farr is going to say... Kind of like Asher did last week. I'm thankful for this community. And I'll never forget Carl Nauer, who always gave me hugs. And I'll never forget Charles Crenshaw, whose kind eyes always smiled at me. And I'll never forget Clarence Roberts, who teased me mercilessly. <laughs> and I'll never forget Frank Balif, who was faithful in offering ninja training. And it occurred to me, none of those men ever went to Asher Sunday School class. None of those men ever went to youth group. But so much of our energy goes into crafting Sunday school, into crafting youth group. And those things have value, don't get me wrong. But the good stuff happens playing plunger ball. The good stuff happens pulling pork. Or not all of it. You can't have just pork pull church, right? But friends, as we shape our congregational life together moving forward, we're the ones who gets to shape it. So I hope we'll pay attention and uh, shape an even more vibrant community moving forward. Happy birthday, Grant. Yeah. Happy birthday. There's a little song. Happy birthday to you. And the song broke out. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you, Grant. Happy birthday.
Grant said he's not 16. But you can ask him how old he is. He probably likes to be asked. Um, Friends, uh, Chestnut Grove, uh, I couldn't be more proud of us, of you, um, for your openness, for an old, old church. You know, Chestnut Grove is 246 years old. And we remain agile. We haven't gotten stuck in hard-crusted places. We remain flexible and pliable, able to move like a body. Well done. Let's keep writing a good story, shall we? Together. Our praise musicians are going to lead us in a song of promise. This is that no matter where we go and how diverse and turbulent it may get, there's someone with us. The God goes with us. And so let's, um, let's pray, and then we'll let them lead us through. God, we give you great thanks that you have given us water from rock from millennia. That you've given us bread from heaven and we didn't even ask. And you just kept pouring it down on us. Like your people from long ago, we tend to notice the things that are uncomfortable and unfulfilling. And we get so focused on what's missing, what's wrong, what's unsatisfactory. Save us from all that, we pray. Help us to be mindful that the very Spirit of God lives in us. And is leading us to a new kind of place where you are on display in our lives every minute. Where love flows from this hill into every corner of this town. Where when folks encounter you here together, we know we're home. Continue to pour out on us, O oh God, we pray. We thank you for loving us in a million ways. It's in Christ that we pray. Amen. Sure. 